Hello Internet, and welcome once again to my reviews for the Indiana Jones movies leading up to Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. This here is our final stop in a movie that I'm dreading reviewing, but I have no choice. Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull is regarded as the worst of the series, and after watching this lord knows how many times, I would have to agree. Some of the casting and the choices the characters make really didn't do it for me, as well as the ending. Like, what the fuck was Spielberg thinking? But before I go into further detail, I just want to say that this has been an amazing journey revisiting my youth with the Indiana Jones movies. Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull was first released on May 22nd, 2008, after Paramount and Lucasfilm went on a 19-year sabbatical after Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. During said sabbatical, we got the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles, a collection of Indiana Jones video games, as well as Tomb Raider and Uncharted. Well, no, they're not Indiana Jones, but Indiana Jones served as inspiration for both Tomb Raider and Uncharted. But it did own four Indiana Jones video games. They are both LEGO Indiana Jones games, Indiana Jones and the Emperor's Tomb for the PS2, and Indiana Jones and the Staff of Kings for the PS2. And we also got some Disneyland attractions themed after Indiana Jones. I might do game reviews of Emperor's Tomb and Staff of Kings, kind of like what I'm doing with these movies, but it will require me to play through those games again. But as of right now, I'm not sure. Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull takes place in 1957, in the midst of the Cold War. Dr. Jones is at odds with the Soviet Union, who are looking for a crystal skull. The leader of the KGB in this movie is Irina Spalko, played by the ever-famous Kate Blanchett, who is well known for her portrayal of Gladriel in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, and Hela in Thor Ragnarok. Joining Indy on his adventure is a greaser named Mutt Williams, played by Shia LaBeouf. To be frank, I'm not the biggest fan of Shia LaBeouf. I mean, I grew up watching him in Even Stevens, but I was never really big on his performance in the Transformers movies. I only ever saw the first two Transformers movies, and that's it. And I fucking hate Megan Fox. She can't act for shit. Mutt Williams' real name is Henry Jones III, a revelation which infuriated me. Like, this came right the fuck out of nowhere. But we learn in the middle of the movie that his mother is Indy's old love interest, Marion Ravenwood, in which Karen Allen reprises her role. But seriously, I don't remember a time where Indy and Marion got a little too comfortable, if you know what I mean, and they had a baby in the end. Nobody told us anything! Maybe Mutt is an illegitimate son? Who the fuck knows? Other than that, Mutt is alright. He's not my favorite. He's no short round, and he's certainly no Willie Scott either. Shia LaBeouf was Steven Spielberg's only choice for the role, and Shia LaBeouf did research on his character by watching Rebel Without a Cause, which is one of my favorite 1950s films ever, as well as The Wild One and Blackboard Jungle, and the costumes for the era were extremely authentic. You can tell this movie takes place in the 50s when the very first song that plays is Hound Dog by Elvis Presley. Seriously, somebody give Austin Butler that Oscar for his portrayal of Elvis. But anyway, the movie starts off with the Soviets raiding Area 51 where they hold Indy captive, as well as a very complicated character named Mac, played by Ray Winstone. Marvel fans may know Ray Winstone as Dracoff from Black Widow. Mac is definitely one of my least favorite characters in the movie, because he keeps switching sides every 20 minutes. First he's one of the good guys, then he's one of the bad guys, and then he becomes a good guy, and after that he becomes a bad guy again. TAKE A SIDE, damn it! This area was previously featured at the very end of Raiders of the Lost Ark, and we even catch a glimpse of the Ark of the Covenant while there's a ruckus going on. So Spalco comes in and forces Indy to help them find the corpse of an alien who carries off a strong magnetic field. And so they have to toss gunpowder into the air and follow it. Yes, people, this movie has aliens! I am already convinced that Steven Spielberg showed up to Paramount Studios drunk off his balls to pitch an idea where Indiana Jones has to do with aliens. Like, seriously, what were they thinking? This is Indiana Jones, not E.T. 2! And after revealing to the Soviets who his favorite Fire Emblem character is... I like Ike. A fight ensues, and Indy manages to escape. All while Mac joins the side of the Soviets. And then, we get what is easily my least favorite scene in the entire Indiana Jones series. He makes it to a model 50s town that could easily pass off as Westview from WandaVision, where the entire town is filled to the brim with mannequins. Apparently, it's a test site for an atomic bomb. So, what's the best way for Indy to survive a nuclear explosion? By hiding inside a fucking refrigerator and flying halfway across Nevada! How he didn't break any bones or die, I have no fucking clue! I don't know what's more ridiculous, jumping out of a plane in a life raft, or surviving a fucking nuclear explosion by hiding in a fucking fridge! GOD! This movie just blows my mind in ways it shouldn't be! So after the FBI interrogate Dr. Jones about his involvement with the Soviets, he's put on a leave of absence from the college he's working at. The dean of the college is Charles Danforth, played by Jim Broadbent. Harry Potter fans may recognize him as Horace Slughorn. 
He's a stand-in for Marcus Brody, who died before the events of Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. The actor who played Marcus Brody, Denholm Elliott, died on October 6, 1992 at age 70. After a brief exchange with Charles, Indy meets Mud at a diner. And let me just say right off the bat that I'm glad we're not going to be seeing Mud again in Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. As I mentioned, I'm not the biggest fan of Shia LaBeouf. Here he talks about an old mentor of his named Harold Oxley, played by John Hurt. John Hurt has drawn in so many famous movies that it's hard to keep track. Well, first he had an alien burst out of his chest in Alien, then there's Ollivander in the Harry Potter movies, he played the War Doctor in Doctor Who, and he did a lot of famous voice roles. Unfortunately, John Hurt died January 25th, 2017 at age 77. Mutt informs Indy that a crystal skull was found in Peru by Oxley. He tells him that he, as well as Marion, have been kidnapped. The crystal skull is part of a legend from Agador, a lost city in the Amazon jungle. So Mutt hands Indy a letter sent by Marion that contains a message written by Oxley in a dead language. But then two KGB agents come in to try to take the letter and capture Indy. But unfortunately, Mutt brings a knife to a gunfight. So then they create a diversion where Mutt punches a guy in the face, thus starting an olive brawl between the Greasers and the Soches. For those of you who don't know what a Soch is, please check out The Outsiders. It's one of my favorite books I read in middle school. And unfortunately, this bar fight does not contain Sonic the Hedgehog running around in slow motion causing mischief. So then we get a motorcycle chase in which Shia LaBeouf shows off his motorcycling skills. It also appears that Shia LaBeouf also knows how to fence, and can handle a sword pretty well. So they get away, and they make it to Peru where they follow the clues left by Oxley. And this is where we learn that the Crystal Skull made Oxley all cuckoo for Cocoa Buffs. So they make it to a psychiatric hospital where we see clues to the final resting place of Spanish conquistador Francisco de Oriana, who searched for the city of Vacator. And here we see that Mutt is afraid of scorpions. And according to Indy, when it comes to scorpions, the bigger the better. If a small one bites you, don't keep it to yourself. So they find the Crystal Skull, where they realize that Oxley actually returned it. Then they get captured by the Soviets. And that's when Indy and Marion reunite, and we learn the infuriating truth that Mutt's real name is Henry Jones III, and that Indy is his father. Spalco deduces that the skull holds great psychic power, and that it belongs to an alien race. Finding more skulls will grant the Soviet Union the ability to control the world via telepathy. And we learn that Oxley speaks only in riddles and clues. So then they try to escape, and Indy and Marion end up in a dry sandpit. And how do they pull him out? By tossing a rat snake over to Indy, and expecting him to grab it. And since Indy is a pussy when it comes to snakes, they just have him pretend that it's a rope, when Mutt and Marion say, grab the rope. Seriously, the dialogue in this movie is awful! And they use CGI far too much in this movie. Particularly with Mutt swinging from vines with monkeys as if he's fucking Tarzan. When did we go from... Snakes. Why did it have to be snakes? To... Grab the snake! I'm calling it that! It's a snake! What do you want me to call it? Hey, rope! What? Hey, grab the rope! Grab, grab the, the rope. rope! It's like Indy is slowly turning into Willie fucking Scott! I mean, when he was played by River Phoenix, he did fall face first into a pit of snakes, and he must have gotten PTSD from that. But if you're stuck in a dry sand pit, and your bullwhip is six feet under, how else are you supposed to escape? Use what's around you! Even if it means a fucking snake, and don't be a whiny bitch about it! It seems that everyone involved in this movie, including Harrison Ford, becomes a whiny bitch towards the middle when they're en route to Akator. Mutt has a hissy fit saying that Indy is not his father, and he just takes him with a grain of salt. And I'm starting to agree with one of the Soviets in the car with them. Oh, for the love of God, shut the hell up! So then the heroes escape and they catch up with Spalco. And then the most unrealistic sword fight in history, involving Mutt and Spalco. You can clearly tell that it was done by a fucking green screen, because nobody would be ballsy enough to go on location to film with practical effects. I can understand that not everyone in Hollywood can be Tom Cruise, but at least make it look convincing. Here, they don't even try to make it look convincing. It's like Spielberg and the Indiana Jones crew stopped giving a shit halfway through production, just sat in a circle, passed around a bottle of Jack Daniels, threw out random pitch ideas, like adding aliens and not shooting on location half the time, we're having Indy climb into a fucking fridge to survive a nuclear explosion! But that's not the end of it, no. After another cheesy scene with Mutt swinging from vines with monkeys, and Mac changing sides for the 30th time in the movie, there's an army of ants that just make things difficult for everybody. Somehow I'm convinced they brought either Scott Ling or Hank Pym on set to train the ants to do a bunch of fucked up shit, so they're scrolling into one guy's mouth and eating him alive. But somehow the ants are driven away by the power of the crystal skull. So then they make it to three waterfalls, which they survive by the sheer power of luck. And that's where the final challenge awaits them. Mac then switches sides a fucking again, 
when he leaves transponders for Spalco and the remaining Soviets to fall. Like seriously, Mac, pick a fucking side! It's not that hard! You can't pick both! That's not how it works around here, jackass! They make it into the chamber where there's a bunch of crystal skeletons, where one skull is missing. But here it's revealed that there's treasures from multiple different civilizations across history. The aliens are studying the different cultures of Earth. And as soon as the skull is returned, the skeletons telepathically offer to give a reward to the group, using Otley as a translator. Spalco demands to simply know all the knowledge of the aliens, but they reanimate and transfer an overwhelming amount of knowledge into her mind, killing her. And at this point, I don't give two shits anymore, because you all know how batshit ridiculous it gets. This movie literally jumps the gun, and it doesn't know what genre it wants to be. Action adventure or science fiction? Pick one, damn it! God! So, after that pandemonium, Indy and Marion get married, and that's the end of the movie. I'm giving Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull a 4 out of 10. This movie aged poorly. People often consider this movie to be the worst in the series, and they are absolutely fucking right. And then there's Terminator 3, Rise of the Machines, The Matrix Resurrections, Speed 2 Cruise Control, Attack of the Clones, The Rise of Skywalker, Jurassic Park 3, Jurassic World Dominion, Transformers The Last Knight, The Godfather Part 3, Batman and Robin, Joss Whedon's Justice League, and Eternals to name a few. Every beloved film franchise has a best movie and a worst movie, and we can all agree that Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull is the worst of the Indiana Jones movies. The dialogue was awful, the pacing was all over the place, and they used CGI way too fucking much. It is an insult to the legacy of Indiana Jones. I'm just hoping Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny is a worthy send-off to Indiana Jones, and that it doesn't turn into another Rise of Skywalker. If you want me to take a look at Indiana Jones and the Emperor's Tomb, and Indiana Jones and the Staff of Kings, please let me know. And I'll have those ready before we get Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. Again, it will require me to play through them again after many years of sitting on a shelf. Also, the next film series I'm going to tackle before Mission Impossible will be Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man movies, leading up to the release of Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. But I will not be reviewing Tom Holland's Spider-Man movies or Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Stay tuned for all those videos and more coming soon. Until then, I'll see you all next time.